the producer in South Park, or South Docs. And I just wanted to um, say that there's a sign-in sheet that's going around, so you could please sign in for that. Um, and I wanted to introduce two events before I get to introducing David. So some information to share. There's a Gilder Jordan lecture happening the following Tuesday, September 13th at 6 p.m. in the Nut Auditorium. And the title for that is Teaching the Truth, Race and Slavery in the Modern Classroom with Dr. Dinah Rainey Berry. And then next Wednesday, uh, September 14th at noon in this room, uh, Martin is gonna have a South Talk titled Race Land Apology of Segregation. And I have the honor of introducing David. And please bear with me as I read this. So <laughs> <laughs> documentary photographer David Wharton will discuss images in his Gamma Gallery exhibition, which includes photographs from his recently published fourth book, Roadside South, the third in his trilogy of the American South series. The exhibition, also titled Roadside South, is currently on view in the Gamble Gallery in Barnard Observatory through September 30th. So that's what you see out there. David Wharton is an assistant professor of Southern Studies and the director of documentary studies at the Center for the Study of Southern Culture. He is the author of four books of photographs, The Soul of a Small Texas Town, Photographs, Memories, and History for McDade, Small Town South, The Power of Belief, Spiritual Landscapes from the Rural South, and Roadside South. Thanks, Melanie. All right. Um, thank you all for coming. I see some old faces that make me feel real good that um, some of those old faces showed up. That's real nice. Thanks for coming. Um, I'm sure at this point you're all tired of looking at this picture. So we'll go on to the next picture. Oh, there it is. And that's actually there on purpose. Um, the point, the point of this blank uh, slide is to sort of give you a little background. I, I moved to Mississippi in 1999 to work here at the center. And um, blah, 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 I immediately started photographing, which is what I do. It's what I did in Texas. I pay a special attention to small towns, rural areas. I can't tell you exactly why. That's what seems to attract me. So when I got here in 99, I started doing that, driving all around, first north of Mississippi and then a little further afield, making photographs. And lots of things interested me, particularly small towns, um, images that uh, related to the spiritual, spiritual aspects, or I would call them spiritual landscapes, uh, in the American South. And at the same time, all these things are happening simultaneously, photographing things that puzzled me and made me curious. Um, didn't really fit into the categories of small town or spiritual landscape, but seemed worthy of stopping and um, photographing. So anyway, the first book I did here was um, Small Town South. Oops, come on now. Okay, that's the cover of that book. That's an image from Holly Springs. And on a couple photographs from it. Same picture, obviously. And another. This one always struck me. In the, in the town aspect of, you know, early towns were um, sort of places where legal, legality, um, religion, and merchandise, um, commerce, sort of came together. And I thought this picture in particular, we're at the corner of Church and Court Street, and we got a great big advertisement for Coca-Cola. So those are just two of the hundred or so pictures from that book. And of course, at the same time, all this is all happening simultaneously. I'm photographing um, what I think call spiritual landscapes. And this book came out in 2016. Um, 
power of belief, spiritual landscapes from the rural south. A couple of images from it. I hope I'm not pausing too much with the pictures. I like, I like to have the time to look at them, and I like to provide you all the time to get, have a good look at them. Okay, and since the publication of that book, well, we're back to this slide you're all tired of. Um, these are things I was photographing all along. So from this book, um, most of the pictures are probably from 2016 onward, but not all of them. A couple of them go back to 99. Um, but I, these pictures, I couldn't quite fit them into categories, and yet there were things that interested me, and they just piled up as work prints in a box. Um, I started, I would look at them, and I'd look at them, and I finally got the notion of this roadside south idea. And what do you see in the roadside south? Well, you see a lot of agriculture, right? Agricultural type images. Cotton field in North Louisiana. There's many cotton fields out there to be photographed. The one, this particular image kind of grabs me because, because of the trees on the horizon, which are echoing both the cotton bowls in the foreground <coughs> and the clouds in the sky. A big egg of cotton. Kind of a peaceful, pastoral, rural scene, which I think it's the kind of scene that exists in most people's imaginations of the South. Um, I'm not necessarily sure that it has a great deal of pertinence to life in the South today. What else do you see? Well, just general landscapes, other than the agricultural in particular, th things that um, struck me as worth photographing. Heck of a place to play basketball. But the court has been carefully um, clipped of the kudzu that would otherwise um, get it. I guess I'll warn you right now. There are, there are 130 pictures in the book. I'm not going to show you all of them. <laughs> and of course, you see a lot of buildings, buildings of all types. <coughs> Excuse me. Again, these kinds of uh, antebellum buildings are around to be seen. I kind of like the way, though, that the grasses in the foreground were catching the light, and in some ways the, the bent, the, the gracefully bent uh, grasses kind of contrasted with the columns. I'm not sure I've ever seen kudzu conform so strictly to a building, a building that engulfs. By the way, if you all have questions in the middle of this, please, please do, just call them out. This, I think, is an exercise in shapes. Triangles, rectangles, circles, ovals.
What would we do without Louisiana? <laughs> Exercise in line and light. It's a very ordinary building, but when the sun's shining from a certain spot in the sky, it takes on, at least I think, takes on something extraordinary. You know, I, I think of, I, I'm not sure if this place were abandoned, was abandoned or not, but I would think of the, the optimism that someone opened this store, named it Dreams and Things, which on this gray day seems interesting. But also the, the parking lot, the asphalt, is, uh, seems to be crumbling before our very eyes. Where is it? Where is that building taken? It's in Kentucky, Berna, Kentucky. I'm sorry. Was it like an occult store? A, a cult store? No, I think it was a secondhand store. Or what, you know, we might call a junk shop. This struck me early on, this, these prefab sheds, et cetera. This one with a front porch and two older style rocking chairs. I think there's some contrast between the style of the buildings and the rocking chairs. And some of you have probably seen this up in Holly Springs. It's the old Mississippi Industrial College, um, which had some pretty, well, still does, have some pretty impressive buildings, most of which are falling into disrepair now. But there's something about the sign in front of the building, the, the falling apart sign and the shadow it casts, um, along with the building. It was part of the Mississippi Industrial College, which 25 words or less, it was set up for freedmen after the Civil War to learn trades. Um, it's right across the street from Rust College, which was sort of the other model for African American education post-Civil War, which is for the talented 10th who were to pursue academics and hopefully pursue careers as doctors, lawyers, teachers, etc. And of course I always love signage. and beauty, extreme beauty. <laughs> I say, what will we do without Louisiana? Now, tell the truth. Who in here would like to go to that football karaoke party? This was towards the end of October, and I'm sure it was uh, Halloween oriented. Except I've only seen it the month. I'm sorry? Except yes, it's close to Pontotoc. 
I've only seen it this one time, um, although I've been over towards Pontotoc late October several times, so it may have been a one-time deal. Kudzu control demonstration. <laughs> The explanation for this is that there was a, a, a chapel called Love Chapel not far from here who I was hoping to move um, to this, I assume, better spot. Well, it was a better spot, I guess. Um, and so they put this sign up, but just there on its own seems a bit unusual. And I've been by that spot several times since, and there's neither a sign nor a new church there. And some things I just couldn't make sense of. I tried to make visual sense of them, to varying degrees of success, but I just couldn't quite figure out how they worked. One of the things I, try to, I tell my students about photography is the photographs are literally two-dimensional things. They have no third dimension. They have no depth, physical depth. So the best photographers are able to imply such depth to their two-dimensional images in a variety of ways. But this seems sort of that photograph that has no depth. I mean. This false front, I couldn't, I have no idea why it was there. It was painted red as though it were a barn, but that was it. There was no sign of, well, of anything that I could make any sense. That was in Union County, Georgia, up in the northwest county of Georgia. Lookout Mountain. This is um, at the Sleep in a Wigwam Motel. It's just out Highway 6 to the east, not very far from here. Animal life. I think I'll warn you that there are no live animals in this section. <laughs> This one puzzled, I mean, I've seen lots of people with, you know, these deer on their lawn all the time, but this was, there was no residence anywhere nearby. It's these two lawn deer emerging from the woods. Who put them there? Why? Yes, sir, you had a question? This is in North Louisiana, St. Helena Parish. I think it's the furthest 
Northeast Parish in Louisiana. Where's Wiley? You recognize that Wiley? Montgomery Allen. I'm sorry? Well, I just drive around and I saw it. It's Marshall County, um, next county north. Um, I saw it. I, you know, I, two possible explanations are that it, it had been roadkill and someone found it freshly enough that they would take it home. Obviously, the head is not worth mounting on anything. I guess that's my, that's what I think. There may be other, there may be other situations there. I like the heart shape, the gravel, or whatever it is, shaped into a heart. Four major food groups. I think this is the last one, folks. I'll be happy to um, take questions. What really, I mean, you, you seem to have an eye for oddities out on the landscape. How do you decide where you're going to go and, and how do you begin to look for some of these things? Well, keep your eyes open and pay attention. In many cases, my lovely wife here, Mary Ann, is driving, so I'm, I can uh, look more freely than otherwise. You know, you just don't ever know. Sometimes you go out and you come home with nothing, nothing worthwhile. Other times, just it's, it's often trying to marry two um, incongruous things that, well, not so totally incongruous that they don't relate. There's got to be some sort of relation between the two. Um, that's the best answer I think I can give to that. It's just um, what more than a single thing can you see um, within the frame? And you know, you try to organize the frame ar around those two or three major elements so that they're not sitting on top of one another, they're spread out across the frame. Yes? that and you're saying I want that to be part of the image too for the, the person who's, who's 
take a moment to look at it, there's going to be this. Yeah, go ahead. My question, yeah, that, that, my question I, I just, I love that. Of course, it's terribly narrowed. My question would be, when you see that, and you realize there's, there's a shock to this, but when the church reports, it's kind of cool. Oh, well, and the physical church itself. And the church right behind. So co- composure, I'm interested in composition. Do you, do you say, I mean, like, did you notice the stop sign right away and say that's going to be part of the shot? Or did you see that? Is that the found object in the sense that it becomes well, a Well, it didn't bother me that it was there. I mean, I, it's there. You can't move it, except in Photoshop, which I don't do. Um, it's there. It doesn't bother me at all. I think the primary things that I'm interested in are the church, the, the street signs, the Coca-Cola um, banner, and, and the church itself in the background. And you want the th- those three elements not to interfere with one another. So in this particular picture, they're in a tight triangle. And the rest of the picture lets those things happen but that's the basis of it. You move around, you move oh, of course, I always move around. <laughs> that's, that's why I never use a tripod, because they're too difficult to lug around. It's just it's much easier to approach, um, or for me, much easier to approach a subject matter from a, several different angles. Whether you actually make the picture or not, you look at it from a number of different angles. Generally, no. The towns were townscapes. Now, my, I have one previous book from Texas in which I dealt very deeply with a single town and the people um, around it. So I, I'd sort of done that. This was a different, I'd call it a, a different um, step forward step in, in my photography where I was just dealing with the physical world. <coughs> and you know, I do call those town pictures townscapes. Yes, sir. Are you? Uh, oh, sorry. Just one. Go ahead. Are you waiting for people to move out? Because it's like there's an absence of people in all of these ones, right? Because there's echoes of humanity. Oh yeah. Even your landscapes are are man-made landscapes, right? Oh yeah, definitely. So Very occasionally, I'll wait for someone to move out of the frame, but particularly in the town photographs, Sunday morning. <laughs> um, and you know, it, I'm sorry, me. Okay. Okay. There's one of the color photographs. I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not Debbie realizing which, are we talking about the foli- color photograph? No, black and white in the gallery outside. Okay, <laughs> he's crossing, it looks like he's crossing the street next to a pickup truck. Well, I think that's a color photograph. It's in oh, S- S- Sumner, Mississippi. Yeah, I think they're right. Yeah. No, actually, I waited for him to get to that spot just because he was, he was lit by the sun and there was, dark space behind him. I kind of waited for him. That was unusual for me. But these color photographs are they're a different kind of photograph. Thank you. Yes, sir. That was kind of my question. <coughs> Everything you showed us was black and white. I didn't realize that there, was, there were color compositions. What's the advantage for you for going black and white and putting color? Well, I started, I've been photographing for almost 50 years. And probably 45 of those years, it's been exclusively black and white film in a dark room, et cetera, et cetera. A combination of things made me switch 
to digital color, including, um, including the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, including the fact that we had a leak in our roof um, April 2020, early in the pandemic, that ruined my two black and white cameras that I, they're old cameras, unusual cameras, irreplaceable, can't really get them repaired. So I just took that as a sign to, plus color just seemed to be, it was a new challenge for me, seeing differently. Um, I was so invested in light and shadow that I had sort of let color slip by, and now I'm trying not to do that. Do you miss those cameras? I do. <laughs> but you know, I'm at an age where I really don't have the time to spend so many hours in a dark room. And so I don't miss that aspect of it. Hours and hours. Hours and hours. That's my wife. Yes. Yes, Wiley. Uh, there's a whole lot more prefab stuff, stuff that goes up very quickly, um, all looks relatively alike. Um, you know, I hate, to, I would say it doesn't seem to have much character, whatever that is, that's kind of a romantic notion, but um, and there's, although I try not to be nostalgic, there's always that element somewhere. Um, but I would say that sort of prefab construction, not just in, you know, in homes, in, um, out, you know, outbuildings. Yes? Dave, I know you don't spend a lot of time on kind of sort of trope types of photographs, but, if, but every now and again, a trend do shows up. <laughs> Well, I can't imagine me taking a, a, a kudzu picture without a basketball court in the middle of it. <laughs> um, you know, if the kudzu or what other southern tropes sort of lead us somewhere else, not just repeti repeatedly doing that, that's, um, that's fine. Charles. How do I do that? I'm not sure, except that I don't believe in the, in the old tropes, the romantic tropes. So I'm, they just aren't attracting me photographically, whereas something that rebalances that idea or maybe even contradicts it, um, or at least calls it into question, maybe that's a better way to put it. How are we doing time wise? I can still answer more questions. Follow up on what Charles said. I, in that line, the, the street after that photo that you showed of um, hay, down, down with hay, uh -huh. baled hay. Right. The first one, I, I, I said, is that a David Morgan photo? <laughs> Precisely because the light was a little low, like that huge yeah. sort of Georgia dusk moment. And I thought, that's so strange. Usually he undercuts. So my, my answer might be that the light, I mean, I think if you have a you like a kind of, in many cases, a kind of harsher light, kind of bare mm. bones, then maybe that's the, struck me that that might be a way, because the one that followed it was bare bones and harsher and didn't go around the sun. Why is, 
That photo, why that photo? Because it did strike me as... Well, it's actually it's, it's very close to the front of the book. And it sort of may, perhaps sets up an expectation that will be... Um, surprise some people as, it, as things come around. I mean, it doesn't, I don't think that first photo surprises, I'm not sure it's first, but it's very early in the book. I'm not sure that it surprises anybody. We've seen lots of photos kind of like that. It was a beautiful spot in the beautiful light. So I think that's why, I mean, sort of set up one of, one of these tropes um, to gently undercut a little bit later. Yes. The one that follows that when you've got this industrial scene behind it, it almost looks like a green thing of power. Yes. Could you put that back up again? Yeah, yeah let me see if I can find it. Is that a trick scene? I'm sorry? What? The recent meal is the power plant behind the hay. Actually, that's not This one here. The one to the lower left. Yeah. So we're talking about, oh, come on. Okay, so you're talking about, first of all, Adam was asking about this okay, one. So that's, that's more powerful. Yes. yes. Then you're, you're in the power plant because it's complete contrast. Well, that's kind of on purpose. No, that's Georgia. That's North Georgia. Debbie. You talk about your dramatic interest in the juxtaposition of incongruity. And I noticed that some of them seem to be basically bad. This is a clearly a juxtaposition. Yeah, uh huh. Some of them seem to be um, filled with rich dramatic content that extends beyond that simple juxtaposition. The one that we focus on for such a long time. Uh -huh. church. And the first thing my eye falls on almost immediately is the empty platter. And it is a juxtaposition of decay with the side of the court street uh -huh. uh, fading while the church side is still fairly vibrant. So there seems to be an implication of some sort of uh, decay of an institution, perhaps, while another still. Well, I'm not sure I was thinking that in particular when I made it. I, it's sometimes r difficult to balance what you find visually interesting, visually curious, with it having some meaning beyond that. You know, I've talked about briefly about photographs being inherently just two-dimensional. They don't have any depth. And you have to somehow insert some sense of depth into them. Um, you know, do you recognize that photo? You know what that is? It looks familiar, but no. Is it Jeff? It's, it's Ashland. Is it really? Yeah. <laughs> And that um, how conscious are you um, when you when you take the photograph perhaps not right afterwards of looking in a photographic position where for instance there's silent photography? I'm sorry, uh, you're gonna have to speak a little louder. Well, yeah, I have been certainly influenced by Walker Evans, um, Eudora Welty, and others, others, and yet I feel that in some cases the signage pictures I take have 
maybe perhaps more irony in them, some of them. Um, they're not, again, I, they're not just pictures for the sake of pictures, at least I hope not. But it, um, some things are attractive, but don't have any depth to them. Um, well, you know, the obvious, obvious one, of course, is the kudzu uh, control demonstration. But that's a bit, that's a bit extreme. But there are more subtle types of things, I think. <laughs> I'm still working on it. <laughs> Jimmy. We have talked about this before, but I, I want to talk ask about the book itself and the design of the book. Uh, within that book, you've got, I believe it's three photographs uh. followed by a blank page. Well, I'm going to give you an answer that some people might think is too highfalutin, and I'll, I'll apologize for that in advance. I've always been um, very attracted to literature, even before I was a photographer. As I became a photographer and I got you know, better and better at it, or perhaps, um, I, started, I would think about that. And I would think that, well, and I do think that, well, photography is no doubt the most literary of the visual arts. <coughs> if I thought about it a little more, I'd start to think as well, but yes, it is that, but it's really more akin to poetry than it is to prose. So that sort of provided me with a notion of giving this book a poetic structure, which it actually, there are six or seven sections that go one, two, three, blank page, one, two, three, blank page, one, two, three, blank page, one, two, three, blank page. And then a final segment within the one larger segment, one, two, three, four, five, end, and then the next segment begins. So I see the individual photographs as like lines in a poem. I see those segments as stanzas. And I think, you know, what I showed you up here is all sort of condensed into um, uh, content. Well, that's content. That's, there's no content in the book in that kind of order. It's all sequenced with certain theme, certain three-picture themes, three-picture themes, and then a larger one that sort of winds it up. <coughs> and if all oh, sounds like BS, I apologize. Well, I've enjoyed this. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, I appreciate it. <laughs>